need to think about with CPR. Why do dogs have cardiac arrest? Respiratory. Okay, mostly because of respiratory. Why do people typically have cardiac arrest? Depends on the age. Okay, so kids are much more like dogs. Dogs do not get MIs, right? So they don't have coronary artery disease. They, you know, if they do, it's like a rarity, and we write it up in the in the journals and things. So. What we need to think about is that all of the things that we're thinking about with CPR for adult humans, we have to step back from. Because the cause of the arrest is, is different. The arrest rhythm is different. So what's the most common arrest rhythm in an adult? Okay, BFib, it's, it's relatively uncommon in dogs. Asystole is our common rhythm. So we have respiratory arrest, they stop breathing, their heart stops. So we need to think about what is happening with cardiac arrest and what our goals are as well. So what is the success rate um, of, of cardiac um, or CPR in people? Four to five percent. Four to five percent. All right. And that problem is that when we watch television, we all think it should be about 97 percent. And so people come into this with this concept that I'm going to learn CPR and I'm going to save my dog. Um, and so that is a really hard misperception that we have. And the chance of us actually being successful is pretty small. The same is true with dogs. I mean, even more so because our most likely field successes in humans are going to be with an MI and an AED. Now, it's going to happen and boom, we're going to be able to do something about that. But if there's a real reason that they arrest it and we can't reverse that reason, we're not going to change what's going on. All right. So, I think it's really important to understand CPR in dogs, but I think you also have to have a very realistic view of when we're going to use it, why we're going to use it, and how we're going to use it. So respiratory arrest is something that is typically reversible. That's the thing that we really do want to focus on, so we do want to make sure that we are aware of why our animal arrested, what happened, um, and what, all, you know, what else might be around that situation. So if it's from you know, electric shock because they were in a situation where they, you know, a hot wire in a, in a pool of water, that would be a different situation for me than if we've got a dog that is now you know, 12 years old and has heart failure and kidney failure and has arrested because that's part of the natural progression of the disease. That situation is not going to be a really likely one to be successful. So with our working dogs, we need to think about the situations that could make a difference. <coughs> Airway obstruction. Again, it's going to be a big one. We're going to start with our Heimlich maneuver um, if we have a complete airway obstruction. We talked about that yesterday. Now we have a willing model here. Um, and so what we're going to do with a Heimlich maneuver, we're going to take our hands behind their chest. We're going to push really hard. You can hear even in this little model that air blowing out. And what we want to do is generate enough pressure to, to dislodge anything that might be obstructed there. Again, with that, we want to try and extend their neck so we have a nice straight line. And if we're going to open their mouths, if we put our fingers in our mouths, they're going to likely bite us. Um, not intentionally, um, but we want to use some sort of um, either some gauze or a leash to open their mouths. And that's going to actually give you a much better view anyway. When we're doing that, and that's the same if we're going to intubate them. So we're going to have it, ideally it's a two-person job. Somebody is restraining and opening their mouth. Um, and then we pull the tongue out and, you know, unless there's a lot of blood or foam in the back, you're going to just see this like big hole that you're going to be able to go ahead and intubate in so much easier than, than humans. Um, and cats are, are more like humans um, in the difficulty to intubate. But dogs are, are really generally very easy. The size of the endotracheal tubes, um, most of your dogs would probably have a, a number 10, um, maybe, maybe larger. So you know, most, most of your EMSs are not going to have those that big of a tube. Um, so in a canine cache, you do want to have some bigger tubes um, available so that you can actually use that for intubation of dogs. Certainly smaller tubes can work, um, but you're going to have the problem uh, that you're not going to be able to provide as much um, of a volume and you're going to have to have your cuff inflated and hopefully make a, a decent seal with that. So with CPR, if you are going to start CPR and if you have a dog that has stopped breathing and collapsed, and again, think about the reason why and how likely you are. Now you may need to do it just because you need to try. And that's okay. That's really important to, to be able to do that. Um, so if you're going to do it, let's do it right. Um, the way we're going to do it is the highest point of their chest is where we're going to place our hands. 
we're going to have our hands flattened together and it's going to be a whole action and it's going to be pressing down. Um, basically we want to try and get a third of the volume of the chest but we also need to release our hands so we can't just like lean on them like this because we need to have that recoil and spring. So all of these principles are the same as you would get from the American Heart Association in humans. We're trying for the same rate, 100 um, compressions per minute. If you've got the dog intubated and somebody breathing for them, ideally with an AMBU bag, uh, oxygen attached, the big thing on the breathing side is 10 to 12 breaths per minute. We don't care how they fall in with the person that's doing compressions. If you're on your own, you're going to do 30 compressions. <coughs> And then you're going to come in, then you're going to come back in 30 compressions. What we know based on the human studies and animal studies is anytime you stop compressions, you lose ground. So the ideal thing is to do as many compressions continuously as possible. The other thing, if you're doing it right, you're going to get tired really fast. Um, and we're going to have that happen. We're going to go ahead and have everybody, we've got three dogs to practice on. And you're going to see how hard it really is to go ahead and get the compression, third of the way down, release it all the way up so you're not leaning on them. Um, a lot of times if I'm in the clinic, I'm going to get a stool and I'm going to stand on it so I've got, you know, really good um, ergonomic approach to this. But you really, you know, take off your sweatshirts before you start doing this. This is a lot of work. Yeah. You break ribs in dogs like you do with humans? You absolutely can break ribs. Um, the dogs tend to be fairly springy, but you can break ribs. And that raises another really good question. What if they've already got broken ribs? You know, what if they have chest trauma? So what, yeah, what if we have a pneumothorax? How effective are we going to be using this kind of a chest compression? This chest compression is not a direct cardiac compression. We're using the ribs to spring back and forth to actually work like a pump to help pump the blood. Um, so we really do rely on an intact chest cavity. We require, we require a normal pleural space, normal pericardial space. So that dog we were talking about earlier, if it had a pericardial effusion, CPR is absolutely no good if we're doing it in the routine external way. If that dog arrests, I'm going into his chest. And that's the only way I'm going to make a difference for that dog, if I can make a difference. So we've got a lot of situations we need to consider. Yeah. Very silly question. All of the pictures and demonstrations and even the mannequin shows the dog on its right side. Does it does the dog need to be on its right side for any reason or can it be as them. Exactly. Um, good question because there are reasons to do one side versus the other, particularly if you're looking at going um, to open their chest. But no, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm not going to spend the time to switch the dog's position. The most important thing, though, is the relationship of you to the dog. If the dog is like this and I'm pushing, they're going to push away from me and they tend to slide off tables. Um, whereas here, I'm pushing into myself. And that's actually, I mean, it's a simple thing, but it makes a huge amount of difference in how effective you can be in your CPR. So that positioning is, and it also makes it easier to go right to their head. So that, that is one of those little positions. Um, there are always questions about uh, abdominal counter pressure. Um, there haven't been any really good studies to document, you know, whether or not that makes a huge difference or not. We know you can cause some injury to the spleen and liver, but it does seem to have some potential to improve the perfusion. Um, we do it sometimes. It's not It's not part of the standard approach to CPI. Question? I noticed when your breaths and you're worried about coming off for you know, a very short period of time, but I noticed your breaths are pretty forceful. You have to be pretty forceful to get a, a good breath through the nose like that to get that down in that short amount of time, I guess. Yeah, you really do. You need to really fill up your lungs and, and, and try and make as much of a seal because remember, you're not going to have a full right. seal, so you're losing a lot of that, which is why having them intubated and having those breaths being given with an AMBU bag are going to be much more effective. What size bag? Um, I use the regular, the adult. standard adult bag. Um, basically, we can think of 10 mils per kilo as their uh, tidal volume. Um, and we do want to be really careful. I mean, and the problem that we have with somebody giving breaths is great, number one, because they get really excited and they start doing breaths like this or, you know, squeezing the bag and then too much volume and then we can get barotrauma so we can actually injure the lungs instead of just giving it that That's gentle why it's less breath. That's why it's feed bag. Yeah, I mean, so if, if you've got a, a pressure monitor on it, you know, we want to try and keep it to 20 centimeters of water, you know, if, if we can go a little bit higher than that, but we really do risk causing barotrauma if we're, you know, getting too excited about how we're breathing and, and we don't want to <laughs> decrease their CO2 by breathing too fast. On, on innovation, what, what are you using for your 
replacement landmarks. I mean, it's people with reports, but. I mean, you can actually visualize it, and you can, you can feel the retinoid cartilages. Um, so you're going to open it up, and the dog's, um, the dog's tongue is going to like be pulled forward, and the retinoid cartilages open up, and there's you know, a nice big gap right into the trachea there. So the epiglottis can sometimes be in the way. You can kind of push that down. I also like to use a long blade on my a laryngoscope. You can intubate them without a laryngoscope, but my question is always why. Why would you make it harder? Why not just do the easiest approach possible? You can also intubate them in lateral. It, it's easier for me in sternal, because that's what we're used to in our anesthesia. But you need to be able to intubate them in lateral. You need to be able to intubate them on their back, whatever direction, so that you can get comfortable with that. But if you're doing it for the first time, sternal is just the easiest um, for, for veterinarians. Now, <laughs> it's sometimes, when we talk to some of our, our physician friends, because of their orientation with people, they actually like them on their back. Um, and it's just a little bit more normal for them to be able to intubate. But truly, they, they are extremely easy to intubate unless you have blood fluids um, obstructing the area. Uh, and they tend not to spasm um, that often either. Cats, on the other hand, are hard to intubate and spasm and make you, make you crazy, right? <laughs> it's, it's remarkable. Yeah, it's like driving pull a truck. The, yeah, pull the tongue out. It's like, okay, train into the tunnel. And it's, just, it's huge. It's, yeah, and that's why we need those big endotracheal tubes because it is, you know. And you can feel their, their trachea. I mean, you can feel how big it is. I mean, it's big. It's really, really big. And so that's going to be something, you know, if you have an obstruction or a partial obstruction, then we've got to think about other approaches and, and it gets a little bit more challenging. Um, what, about, what about doing a, a crack or doing a tracheostomy? Um, yes, we can totally do that. Um, we actually, when we do a tracheostomy, we don't go through the cricoid um, ligament though. We actually go between the, the rings. Um, so that would be something that would be, again, more advanced. Um, but if, if that's the way that we're going to get the airway, and in our military working dogs, we don't intubate them because they have muscles on. Um, you know, and so they worry more about what happens in that process of you know, when they're not quite all the way gone or when they're waking back up. So that is actually one of our first um, things that we're going to do for airways. We're going to do go ahead and do a trach, um, temporary trach or a needle, a needle trach just to get some oxygen to them. So again, it depends a little bit on the dogs that you're working Do dogs have a cricket thyroid? They do, but it's too far off, and there's no reason to not go um, in, in between the rings. Because right here on their neck, it's, it, the, the trachea is, is perfectly superficial, and you want to go on midline, uh, but you can feel it really well, and so we want you to feel that on, on your dogs today. Do you try to go as distal or, sorry, I don't remember the, the mouth? Um, we actually try, we go about halfway down. Yeah. Um, again, we've got a long distance down into um, to the bifurcation, and so we, we actually like to be able to deliver, you know, whatever we're delivering, you know, if it's just oxygen. And we have to, you know, if we can do that with a needle, we sometimes will we'll pass a, a long intravenous catheter, you know, through that needle and provide that as long as we don't have too high a frequency. Have you ever used the IV tubing? Um, I haven't used IV tubing, no. The administration set? Spike. Yeah, where you spike the bag, that, that, that sharp point, uh -huh. spike oh, the bag, wow. you cut it off, put use it, that? stick it in their neck. And that chamber, that filling chamber, happens to be the same diameter. Fifteen millimeter bag. So oh, cool! That's a great. Works for humans as well. That's actually that's a great tip. I, I hadn't um, hadn't done that, and that's you know again one of these field tips that we can pick up. That's that would be a really useful thing. We usually have those kind of IV bags. The thing that we sometimes have in our IV bags are the the, the fine drip, and we wouldn't want to use a fine drip. We'd want to use the the, the big drip one. So that would be um, yeah, that would be the important part. But that that's a great idea, and that's something we'll have to. Around with. And then if, like, if I'm in a situation where I'm having to use an ADO in the tracheal tube because that's all that I have, how deep do you go? I mean, is it 15 centimeters? And, and one of our average dogs. Yeah, so goes, with these dogs, I mean, basically what we're talking about is that the bifurcation um, is about right there. So we're it's pretty hard to get um, a, a trach tube that deep down. Um, you know, some of our really big ones, you can intubate a single a single lung. Um, but what we usually try and do is, is you know, measure from the nose to right about here, which would be about the you know, eighth rib or so. Um, and that'll give you a sense. And, and you know, if you doubt, pull it back a little bit. Because again, you've you got a huge amount of, of trachea here. They've got a really long trachea before they fly. Any other questions? So what we'll do is